Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm here today with Quinn Shepard and Samir Mehta, the writer and showrunner, respectively, of the seven-part, excuse me, eight-part Hulu limited series thriller Under the Bridge, starring Oscar nominee Lily Gladstone and Emmy nominee Riley Keough. Uh, it's based on the 2005 true crime book of the same name by Rebecca Godfrey, who's also a character in the story played by Kia. Quinn, of all the murder mysteries out there to adapt, why did one based on a novel nearly two decades old so pique your interest? Oh, good question. I think because I, I wasn't trying to make a murder mystery. Like I, I honestly have never been somebody, I know that there's such a culture of like obsession with true crime. It's never really been my thing. I, I'm not somebody who really enjoys the sort of like sensationalism of violence. And I, this book came to me kind of by chance. Um, one of the producers who was attached to the project when it was kind of in very early stages at Hulu, had read a script that I had written that was fictional um, that had just some really similar themes. And she she sent me the book and said, hey, does this interest you? And like immediately hearing about it, I was shocked that I had never heard of the crime because it happened in the late 90s. It's extremely famous in Canada, but there's really almost no knowledge of it in the States. Uh, and I was really intrigued by it, but it also seemed really daunting because it was such a such a brutal thing that had happened. Uh, and then I opened the book and the book had so much tenderness and so much empathy and was such an exploration of coming of age and girlhood. And it was so unexpected. I just really fell in love with it. And I saw it as like a deeply human story that would allow me to talk about some of the topics that are the most important to me as a filmmaker. And yeah, I was, I, I fell in love. <laughs> same, qu same question for you, Samir. Why this why a story based on the murder of a 14-year-old girl in British Columbia that's now more than a quarter century old? I think what I was immediately struck by was just the question of how is this possible that this could ever have happened? Um, and I felt a kind of burning need to answer that question, maybe in some effort to help stop something like this from ever happening again. And it became kind of an, an interesting opportunity to look at all of the various blind spots that had to exist for something like this to kind of for, for the fates to sort of stack all of these events in a row to lead to something that was so easily preventable that so obviously should never have happened for any number of reasons. Um, and I thought it was an opportunity to look at like the various cycles and the various kind of emotional um, kind of ingredients that were necessary to lead to this so that that cycle could be broken. And ultimately it was a lesson in breaking cycles of violence, which I just felt was really important to portray. How much of your uh, own motivation came from wanting to tell the story of an Indian daughter of an immigrant? Uh, a, a large part of it. I think that um, one of the many, many aspects um, that led to the tragedy, I think was Rena's own sense of, you know, alienation, not only outside the house, but inside the house. And it was really a story of a family trying to connect and maybe not always doing that perfectly. Uh, definitely something that I've experienced. And I thought, yeah, aside from what happened to Rena, uh, I wanted her to be defined not by that, but by actually who she was and kind of the, just the day-to-day -day emotional struggles that she faced. Uh, to me, that was kind of a far more captivating story than her tragic end. It's such a harrowing story. Oh my God. Um, it, it's so interesting, Quinn. The series is told from the perspective of Godfrey herself as she researches her book. Was there a template you could follow for that unusual kind of storytelling? I mean, exposing the nightmare of middle school students, basically. I mean, I think that the, I think, you know, we talked a lot about Capote as a reference for this in, in the sense that it allowed us to explore like the very nature of what true crime is, what it does to somebody who decides 
to insert themselves into a story like this um, and how they grapple with becoming like the defining voice that tells the story. The choices that they make and the opinions that they have on the people involved is what shapes like the most known narrative about them. Um, and I mean, I think that there was it was it was in part that wanting to be able to comment on the nature of true crime itself and on perspective and bias and all of that, but also, you know, just Rebecca having such a fascinating story of being in her 20s when she wrote this and kind of throwing herself into the lives of the kids and driving them around in her beat up car and, you know, her dad dropping her off because in the beginning she didn't have a car and she couldn't drive and her dad would have to like drive her to juvie and like she would sit on the steps waiting for him. And I think she felt like she was like returning to her own childhood in the town in a lot of ways when she wrote this. And I think we just thought that that was such a fascinating story to get to explore in the show. Was the idea here, Quinn, also to remind viewers that being in middle school can feel like an episode of The Sopranos? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's what <laughs> Samir oh, yeah. said best. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, to be honest, like, it, there's no difference. <laughs> it it really, like, yeah, to feel, uh, you know, like one day you can't sit at the lunch table and, like, you may as well have been, like, you know, taken out back and, and popped it, it really is true. Um, I mean, remembering middle school myself, uh, th there's there's no more harrowing time in our lives. Yeah. And, and we're so unprepared for it at, our, at that age. Um, uh, Samir, you or actually both of you, you really seem to hit the jackpot with the casting here of your leads. Oh, yeah. Uh, Willie Gladstone was still kind of a relative unknown, I think, when you cast her before mm -hmm. Killers of the Flower Moon was released. And uh, ditto for Riley Keough before uh, before Daisy Jones and the Six. How did that come together? Was it just kismet, basically? Actually, literally kismet. I uh, I had moved into a new house about a month before I got this job, uh, met my new neighbor, and I was just kind of, and, and then we became close friends. Uh, I told him, oh, I just started this show. Like, here's what it's about. There's the, the central characters, the, actually the author of the book that we're adapting. And I think I showed him a picture and he was just like, oh, like, I know Riley Keough. She should do it. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> and then it just so happened that Riley and Lily had been corresponding for some time, very eager to work together. And also actual Rebecca had recommended Lily to us. It was just kind of this perfect storm and it it all came together beautifully. And amazing chemistry they had together. Totally. Yeah. Um, Quinn, I know you collaborated with Rebecca Godfrey for what, nearly three years adapting the book before her death from cancer in 2022. How would you describe your work dynamic and chemistry together? It was, we were very close. It was very like loving, if that makes sense. I think it, it, we both had this sense that there was like a faded nature to us meeting. Um, I think also because Rebecca was, was very sick for the time that I knew her, you know, we had a lot of conversations that were a bit spiritual, like a bit global about, you know, she had written this book in the 90s. Then she had tried for like 15 years to 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 see if it could be adapted for screen. I think it had reached a point where she thought it wasn't going to happen. And then we met and um, she was very generous with me. She shared like the most personal sides of herself. She gave me her diaries. She let me like read all of her innermost thoughts. She allowed us to explore like a very real family tragedy that she'd experienced like in the show. Um, and she was so generous with also being open to us, like taking some fictional liberties and, and she just wanted the character to be complicated and dynamic the way that she would have written a heroine, you know, or an anti-heroine. And uh, yeah, it was, we, we were very connected and it was, it was a great experience working with her before her death. How tragic for her to have passed just, just at the time when it was actually coming to, all coming to fruition and, and you had the deal, um, like a week later, right? Yeah, it was six weeks before we started filming the pilot. So we were already in Vancouver. Um, like building sets and, you know, the cast was just coming together. We hadn't cast everyone yet, but she did know that Riley was playing her, which she was so happy about. She really loved, loved all of Riley's work. And, and I was going to ask if she had any input into the casting herself. Yeah. I mean, she was so happy it was Riley, <laughs> truly. I remember like, she just said like, oh, I've always felt like something when she's come on screen that I didn't know what it was. And I think now I know. <laughs> Um, Samir, uh, why was it important to you to do, to do something kind of totally unique to the true crime genre? Doesn't that represent sort of more of a risk? I mean, to have an eight part 
something eight eight parts as a limited series, but that's so unique to have literally a, a the writer of the book be be a character and and our storyteller as we're following along. Yeah, I mean, I think throughout my career, I I sort of very deliberately try to do something that's a complete like kind of left turn from the last thing I did. And I had done a bit of true crime before. So to begin with, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it at all. But then I decided if I'm going to do true crime, and there were so many aspects to the story that were so interesting to me, I had to, at the very least, find a way to try to reinvent it. Um, And so that became about finding this balance of using enough convention to make audiences feel comfortable that they're in good hands, but then also subvert the genre at every possible step. Um, And, you know, it's largely why, you know, you don't expect to stop and go to the seventies in the middle of a murder mystery, but we did it. (laughs) I was going to say, what was your own uh, middle school experiences like? Did you have anything like that where, where there were clicks and where you felt like you were on the outside looking in? Did, could you relate to anything that happened uh, absolutely cause this all to go to take place yeah I mean both pretty yeah, bullied in middle yeah, school yeah I think I don't I think uh anyone who grows up to be uh, a filmmaker uh <laughs> on some levels probably bullied when they were in middle school um but yeah I mean definitely I think yeah we both definitely related to that um and I think uh yeah I mean a lot of it actually is probably literally in the show in in so much as that you know we Reen is the one person we weren't able to speak to to get her account. So to the best of our ability, we had to excavate our own childhood wounds to try to access some sort of universal truths about being a child who's suffering in this way. And I think a lot of our own personal experiences uh, made our way into Rena's story. For sure. And Hollywood really is kind of a metaphor for middle middle school. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's just one giant middle school, essentially. Yeah. Quinn, what you're really examining, or both of you, I think, in this show is really the whole nature of truth itself and who's telling it, what does it mean, and who's being manipulative for their own motivations. There's like some Rashomon going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fast. I mean, it's that had to appeal to you, too. I mean, it's fascinating the way the way that literally truth itself is on trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was... Uh... It got increasingly personal, the scripts, I think, as we got deeper into the process of becoming a part of this story that has been going on for so long. And, you know, by telling it, we became a part of it. I think that we started to understand like more and more where everyone went psychologically, like where somebody like Rebecca went psychologically as she was telling this story and how involved she must have felt in its fate. Um, so we just like, I think as the season goes on, you see more and more of our own psyche kind of woven into the scripts mm-hmm. of unpacking like, yeah, what your role is as a storyteller when you tell a true story. I think that neither of us were like fully emotionally prepared for how 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 personal it, it really became and how much responsibility like weighed on us. I think it, it's such a sensitive story and it was so important to, to both of us to do it right um and yeah and the the idea that truth is not a solid object it's a a constantly evolving living organism that grows and deepens over time and you know there was a there was a certain truth in in kind of 97 there was a truth in 2000 you know early 2000s when the book came out and there are evolving truths that we now know it with sort of a more conscious perspective what, what do you think Rebecca's, uh, oh, I mean, I'm sure you must know, uh, Quinn, what Rebecca's motivation was in becoming so involved and so obsessed with this case? I think when she stumbled into the story, she was interested in talking about all of the themes that it touched on, but through fiction. You know, she was working on a book that was quite literally about two girls in the foster care system who kill somebody and then are dealing with cops and going to juvie. And then she by chance doing her research for that met these girls who were actually involved in a real murder and who were in the foster care system and were going through a lot of these things. It was very like kismet. Um, I think she felt like, especially in the 90s, true crime gave her the 
ability to get an audience for a book that was about troubled young women. And that was something that was so important to her to talk about and to not sanitize the kids, any of the kids, including Rena, and to really dig into all of their psyches. And, you know, because it was crime and crime was having a moment, it really, it being a true story gave her permission to talk about those topics. And I think, like, we sort of found something similar with this. Both yeah. of us have been interested in telling stories like this through fiction before. And now, you know, we recognize the responsibility of having to kind of carry that through truth. Excellent. Thank you. We're going to leave things there. Uh, Under the Bridge premieres over Hulu with the first two episodes on April 17th. Quinn Shepard and Samir Mehta, best of luck to you both. This Thank you. And, Thank and you. thanks for joining us today, Gold Derby. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah.